Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, my Lord, ladies and gentlemen. Councillor Paulus Playdell, that good scholar and excellent lawyer, is one of the many shrewdly observed characters which Sir Walter Scott based upon the friends and mentors of his youth among the legal and intellectual society of late 18th century Edinburgh. In a memorable passage in Guy Mannering, the advocate is depicted in his library, proud in the possession of the best editions of the best authors. These, said Playdell, these are the tools of my trade. A lawyer without history or literature is a mechanic, a mere working mason. If he possesses some knowledge of these, he may venture to call himself an architect. Playdell, for whom history and literature distinguished a life that would have been infinitely the poorer if devoted solely to the arid study of the law, I mean no disrespect uh, to present company at the top or even the lower tables. <laughs> a hail whack of lawyers, indeed. But it, it, it seems to me to have a general and archetypal relevance beyond his function as a mere supporting player in a novel. In creating him, Scott offers a telling commentary on the connections between the legal profession and the progress of literature, or indeed culture in general, in the Scotland of the late 17th and the 18th century. The most enduring link between the law and learning is certainly the creation and unaided maintenance for nearly 250 years by the faculty of advocates of their great library. Now, another Scott character, by contrast, appears alien to the world of the 18th century Edinburgh lawyer. For Mr. Saunders Fairford in Red Gauntlet, it was the law alone that led to fame, rank, and eminence. By that road did he hope to see his son, Alan, attain distinction, rather than that the young man should covet the barren laurels of literature. Scott himself, though an advocate and as clerk of session, a legal official, saw life in exactly the opposite way to the elder Fairford. In demitting office in 1830, Scott expressed his gratitude to the Lord President for the tolerance shown to him. And reading between the lines, we may realize that this actually referred to his literary avocations, which had led him to use court time for private writing, or at any late rate, private thinking. His position as the doyen of literary lawyers was not resented, and his eminence was seen only as an ornament to the tradition of humane and liberal learning of the Scottish bar. Of the legal profession, Lord Coburn was to write, it is the highest that the country knows. It has always been adorned by men of ability and learning. Its higher practice has always been combined with literature, which indeed is the hereditary fashion of the profession. Its cultivation is encouraged by the best and most accessible library in this country, which belongs to the bar. The literary and historical interests of the members of the Faculty of Advocates led them to found and to develop that great library, which in the range of its collections went far beyond its owner's legal concerns and into the realm of their private, personal, scholarly pursuits. When, in 1689, Sir George Mackenzie of Rose Hoch formally opened the library that had been his brainchild, he described his creation as this Parnassus and bosom of the muses. One can just hear the officials of the Scottish Office Education and Industry Department <laughs> bandying a phrase like that as they contemplate yet a further cut in the National Library's purchase grant and yet greater restrictions on the staffing budget. Walter Scott was, all his legal and literary life, a devoted supporter of the library's role and standing as the de facto National Library of Scotland, a regular reader, and indeed as one could then be, a borrower, and at one point, a curator, charged with the oversight of the library's affairs. There is no doubt that he treasured the priceless scholarly resource 
that the Faculty of Advocates had established and maintained ostensibly in their own name, but in practical terms for the nation as a whole. More than princely was his estimate of the collection in 1824. You may be amused to know that when I was working on the history of the Advocates Library in preparation for the tercentenary celebrations of 1989, I came across a fascinating and previously unknown reference to Scott as a curator of the library in 1796. The library was then also something of a museum collection with antiquities of all kinds. In that year, the medal cabinets were found to be in some disorder and Mr. R. Hodson Kay and Mr. Walter Scott, curators of the library, were instructed to put the coins in proper arrangement. Progress was painfully slow. Two years later, the curator's minutes record only the fact that the two young advocates had at least succeeded in collecting the keys to the cabinets. Scott did begin the catalogue of the coins, the manuscript, long forgotten and unrecognised, I found among the papers of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland in the National Museum. A later minute of 1798 records the unsatisfactory state of affairs with the coins, but makes a highly significant comment on their would-be cataloguer. Mr. Kay was always absent, and Mr. Walter Scott had no leisure from his other avocations to attend to matters. It is his other avocations, pursued no doubt in other parts of the library, which bring us together tonight and every year. For Scott's literary career had begun with his translations from the German. Those of us who work today in the National Library must always be conscious that we are the heirs of the great tradition of the Faculty of Advocates, when the, which the new national institution inherited in 1925. The faculty began to collect historical manuscripts in 1698. We continue that policy into the late 20th century. Under David Hume, keeper of the library from 1752 to 1757, a policy of buying contemporary European literature was initiated. It has continued more or less unchanged to the present, although it is now under serious threat from funding cuts. The copyright privilege, that is receipt of legal deposit copies of United Kingdom publications, free books, is one we have jealously guarded as a marvellous advantage, despite its concomitant burdens of having to keep the dross along with the golden nuggets since 1710. The Advocates Library acquired its first Scott manuscript as early as 1850, when the autograph manuscript of Waverley was presented. By then, Scott had been dead only 18 years, and many in the faculty will have known him personally. The manuscript lacks a good few leaves, which had already been extracted and given away almost as sacred relics to admirers of the Shirah. It is one of our tasks to buy and gather in items, such as those stray sheets, from that and the many other Scott manuscripts acquired subsequently by the Advocates Library until 1925 and by the National Library since then. Marmion, the Lord of the Isles, the Heart of Midlothian, Red Gauntlet, the Fair Maid of Perth, Quentin Durward, the Life of Napoleon, and many, many others. I hope and believe that Walter Scott would be pleased and proud of what we do. Perhaps his shade, if ever it passes from Parliament Hall to the strong rooms in George IV Bridge, has seen something of the vastness of the Scott collections as they stand today. I trust he is aware, for example, that in December 1996, we bought a fine and unknown letter about one of his favorite subjects, and uh, John Whiteman's as well, I think, the raising of a dismounted Roman yeomanry regiment of loyal border shepherds, which was to be used to suppress any threat of radical unrest after the Peterloo massacre in 1819. Characteristically, Scott interested himself much in the details of uniforms and accoutrements and who should be the officers. 
The previous month, we had brought an early letter describing Scott's actions in another time of political tension. On this occasion, in Edinburgh in 1796, in the shadow of the French Revolution and the Terror. This letter indicated that an unknown publication of Scott's in the periodical press was to be searched for, and I'm happy, I'm happy to report that I've now been able to identify this. Then, in January of this year, we took on deposit an important collection of papers of the family of Scott's brother, Thomas, which included long-lost notes used by Walter as background material when writing the Peveril, in, writing Peveril of the Peak. In a few days' time, we shall be bidding at auction in London. God knows where we find the money in these hard times, but Scott is too close to our hearts for us not to make sacrifices elsewhere. We'll be bidding in London for a letter illustrating Scott's friendship with the painter William Allen. We marked our tercentenary with a fine present to ourselves, the page proofs of Scott's History of Scotland, which seemed a particularly attractive thing for a Scottish national institution to buy itself at such a moment. And of course, in 1986, we bought the most expensive manuscript acquisition of our entire history, the interleaved set of the Waverley novels, the so-called magnum opus together with the Fortzheimer manuscripts. These great purchases, only slightly tainted in retrospect by the fact that the largest single contributor to our appeal was Mr. Robert Maxwell, <laughs> whose money was almost certainly not his to give. <laughs> so we are doing our best for Scott. If he were alive today, I'm sure he would do his best for us for we have need of doughty supporters such as he. These are difficult times for the National Library. We have been cut to the bone and cut again. The copyright privilege may perhaps be under threat. If we do not, by law, have to take all those books, so the argument runs in certain quarters, then we will not need expensive new buildings every generation. We have to safeguard our collections. We guard the, the memory of the nation, after all, by ensuring that our buildings are secure from fire. Hence the need to close George IV Bridge for a year while a sprinkler system and fire stairs are installed. We must try to reconcile this vital long-term requirement with the legitimate current demands of scholars for an efficient and uninterrupted public service. I've been thinking of Scott's concern for the library of his day over matters of government support and building crises. In 1813, Scott wrote to his member of parliament, urging him to fight for the retention of the library's copyright privilege and to be ready to ward off the very deep wound aimed against it. The library, Scott argued, should be publicly funded. As Thomas Carlyle later put it, even more forcefully. The library, run for Scotland as a whole, fairly deserves all reasonable help and support from whatever calls itself a government in that country. Scott looked to the government to pay for the new building of which the library was in urgent need in the 1820s. It should be large enough to last a century and more. The new building the National Library got from public funds in the 1930s was too small even before it opened. We are now condemned to an institutional future on a tripartite site. My Lord, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I have acknowledged adequately and certainly at far too great length Mr. Whiteman's handsome proposal of the National Library's health. We are certainly alive, if not perhaps terribly well. We are a robust organism now in our 308th year, and likely, I think, to survive a little longer. Things could be worse. We could be the British Library. <laughs> I also hope that I've indicated our devotion to the memory of Sir Walter Scott in the form of his books and manuscripts and memorabilia. He is safe in our hands. I look forward 
to wel welcoming the club on a visit to see the Scott collections in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thank you.